And we begin, we begin with prayer. Lord, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Here again the words written for us in Jeremiah chapter 9. This is what the Lord says. The wise man should not boast in his wisdom. The strong man should not boast in his strength, nor the rich man in his riches. Instead, let those who boast, boast about this, that they have understanding and they know me. They know that I am the Lord, who shows mercy, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. You may be seated. My dear friends, difficult times often reveal quite a bit about our hearts and where they are at. I think we see that in our nation right now, don't we? We see that there are those who seem to delight in chaos and causing destruction. There are those who delight in in being brutal. There are those who delight in shaming others for their actions which they do. There are those who delight in taking advantage of a situation for their, for their own gain. There are those who delight being in the spotlight and using everything to make it all about them. There are those who delight in causing other people to react to everything they say or do. The present crisis reveals a lot. It also reveals a lot about our own lives. There are certain things that we realize how much we delight in now that maybe they've been taken away a little bit. We delight in the time we get to spend with one another. We delight in this time we get to spend in God's word. We delight in the opportunities to go out and do things and interact with other people. And yes, we delight in being able to see the kindness and love of strangers. You see, we see a lot about our hearts. We see a lot about our hearts in a time of crisis like this and where is our delight? Well, in our lesson today, Jeremiah tells us about God's delight. He tells us what the Lord's delight is. And he tells us what the Lord's delight is so that in those things, in the Lord, we make our boast that we know him. He tells us the Lord's delight so that they would also be our delight in our lives. Take a good look around. If you think things are tough now, you just wait. Be on your guard. You think your neighbors, your leaders are your friends while well, they are just laying a trap for you. Warm up your voices. Get ready to weep and wail for the trouble that is coming your way. That's Jeremiah's cheerful message here in chapter 9. And you may think you're clever. We'll figure a way out of this thing. You may think we're strong and brave and we won't give up. You may think, well, we're prepared. We can ride out various hard times. We can buy and sell favors. You may think these things, but God's judgment will catch you unaware. Judah didn't pay attention. For all their perceived wisdom, they did not think repentance was necessary. For all their perceived strength, God's judgment would certainly overwhelm them. For all of their riches, gold and silver would never save them. We are a fairly educated bunch. Our culture loves to demonstrate just how enlightened we are. Certainly we have grown so much more just and knowing than those backwards people back at the time of Jeremiah. Or maybe we don't have to go back that far. We can go back to the founding of our nation or 150 years ago or even sometimes five years ago. We are so much more enlightened today. 
Today, maybe physical strength isn't nearly all that important. We have technology to broadcast our thoughts and manipulate society to meet our needs. We have other ways of securing our homes and keeping them locked up tight. We can keep a gun, even carry one, that great equalizer, so that we can handle any threat. And wealth? Kings have dreamt of the wealth that most of us enjoy. Our cupboards are nearly always full. Our fridges are often overflowing with food. We ride around and get places in cars that that are often rides of great luxury where even music plays for us while we go along. In a free nation, which has fought against certain injustices for nearly its whole history, it's, for, it's easy for us to ignore the injustice that still exists today. With so much wealth floating around, we can easily deceive ourselves into believing that poverty is the fault of the poor. Have we learned the lesson of Judah? Are we paying attention to Jesus' warning to the rich man? Jeremiah calls to us, this is what the Lord says. The wise man should not boast in his wisdom. The strong man should not boast in his strength, nor the rich man in his riches. How silly it is to think that these things impress God. How foolish it is to, hold, that, to think that we can hold back his judgment. How deadly it is especially when the whole world seems to be focusing and crying out about injustice, how deadly it is for us to ignore God's call to repent. Perhaps you've noticed, however, that the world's answer to injustice doesn't really seem to match the Lord's very well. He says, vengeance is mine, but the world wants to get even. He says, repent But why change our lives and the way we act when we can signal how virtuous we are? Even in the cries for a better society, we hear the same boasts. Our enlightened wisdom, our strength and solidarity, our plan of what we can do with our great wealth of our nation or possibly the wealth of others. You don't hear a call to repent and turn to the Lord. Through Jeremiah, the Lord calls us to repentance. And while he does, he tells us that we have one and only one reason to boast. Not wisdom, not strength, not riches. Instead, let those who boast, boast about this, that they have understanding and they know me. We are a nation that loves our celebrities and we have come to realize that just because you see an actor or an actress, a musician or an athlete on TV, even hear one of those long interviews where you really feel like you get to know them, you don't know those people at all. And often when that favorite actor or actress that you admire does or says something so scandalous, people are shocked and even hurt. What they thought they knew wasn't true. Sometimes the exact opposite happens. You can see someone and you think you know what that person will be like by some superficial appearance, but then a kind, thoughtful, and pleasant interaction can change your whole perception. What you thought you knew wasn't true. People have all sorts of impressions about God. Some want God to be remade into the tolerant view of the world, as if God is love is the only verse that exists in the entire Bible. And then they are shocked when God's harsh words strike against their hearts. Others see only an angry God, either because of the anger of those who claim to follow him or because they read about God's judgment and the way he has governed the nations and punished them for their sins. They may read the same Bible. They may even claim to know the same God, but they only see what they want to see. They only know what they are willing to consider. 
I often find that when people say, I don't believe in God, the first question that I need to ask in my mind or maybe even out loud is, what is this, who is this God that you don't believe in? You see, Jeremiah tells us exactly who God is and what it means to understand him. He says, instead let those who boast, boast about this, that they have understanding and know me. They know that I am the Lord who shows mercy, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Who is God? He is the Lord of mercy, the Lord of justice, the Lord of righteousness. How do we know him and his true nature? Mercy, justice, and righteousness are what he does. The Old Testament believers at Jeremiah's time could have looked at their history. All those times God had been patient with them. They could have listened to God's promises and seen how much God cared and loved for them and the mercy that was in all of those words. They could have listened to the voice of the prophets and repented and turned and lived and received God's blessing. Of course, we today, we have a clearer picture of who God is. Because we have seen who God is as he has come and taken on our flesh. You can watch Jesus as he interacts with people. His hands are always working for them. You can listen to his words. He never once excuses a single sin. And yet he always welcomes and forgives the sinner who repents. You can walk with him on his path to Jerusalem, on his path to the cross, Watch how he was unjustly arrested and cruelly treated. The sinless, perfect Son of God, the one who lived God's love perfectly with his every breath was condemned. And he died unjustly at the hands of a heartless government. More than that, you can see the real reason Jesus suffered. That he suffered under God's wrath. God's anger God's hatred of sin and unrighteousness and acts of injustice. He suffered for all of our sins. He suffered for our injustice, for our carelessness, our pride, and our greed. He cried out, Father, forgive them. And then, even though he has suffered and died, he invites us to come to him to believe in him and there in him to know what love, what mercy, what justice, what righteousness really are. This is your boast, your only boast. In Christ, God mercifully forgives your sins. This is your boast, your only boast. You can know what God enacts his righteousness on earth but not in anger, not in punishment, but by forgiving you all your sins in Christ Jesus your Lord. This is your boast, that you can know what righteousness is. You can see what righteousness does. This is your boast. By faith, you know God. You know his mercy. You know his justice. You know his righteousness. And in Christ you can fully understand and receive his salvation. This is the Lord's delight to show you his mercy, his justice, and his righteousness here on earth. God said he delighted in mercy and justice and righteousness, but his people didn't. The Old Testament prophets never spoke about sin in general terms. They always spoke to the sins that the people were committing. They spoke against God. They said when God was angry that his people didn't show mercy. They told that God hated when he saw justice abused, that God would only tolerate their unrighteousness for so long. God delights in mercy, in justice, and in righteousness on earth. Do we? John asks, If a man does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? 
the words of Jeremiah force us to ask, If God delights in mercy, justice, and righteousness on earth, how can we tolerate hatred and vengeance, injustice and racism and uncaring hearts? How can we tolerate sin and the destruction it brings which is running rampant in the world all around us? (laughs) But we hear those words. And there are so many problems here on earth. We each have been wronged in various ways at various times. We see people struggling and hearts aching in every direction. We hear the angry voices ringing in our ears. We witness so much sin in every direction. We turn. It's exhausting, isn't it? We just want to turn it off and make it all go away. We don't know where to start to reach out. And when we are struggling with our own problems, the own things in our own lives, we quickly run out of love and that energy to show that love in the world. We'll drive for hours and then we'll hike for miles, sometimes even in the pouring rain because this is Oregon after all, just to see water falling off a cliff and then we'll stand and we'll stare at that water falling down for minutes sometimes even hours we'll watch its foam as it strikes against the rock and watch the mist rise into the sky it has a mysterious beauty that is just captivating but why there's something about listening to that roar, seeing it go and go and go that drowns out the rest of everything else. And there's something wonderful about it because even though it's so much water, sometimes hundreds of thousands of gallons of water a minute flowing out, the waterfall never seems to run out. It never drains. Because that waterfall that we love to watch always has a river flowing behind it. John says, we love because God first loved us. The only way we can possibly begin to delight in mercy, justice, and righteousness as God does is to have his love, his mercy, his justice, and his righteousness flowing within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Knowing our sins and the mercy God has shown to us opens our eyes to see those who need our kindness and mercy. Understanding God's justice, the justice of sins forgiven, the justice of true equality in Christ, the justice of sacrificing self, our wants and our needs to serve others, defines our search for justice in the world. Understanding righteousness, God's Righteousness, defined in his word, lived in Christ, received in our baptism, drowns out the phony righteousness that displays it for the praise of others. It rebukes the sinful righteousness that the world loves to cheer. It restores a right relationship between God and us, between God and others, between each of us and each person that we meet. God's delight is to do mercy, justice, and righteousness on earth. He delights to show it to us, but he also delights when his people, those who carry his name in the world, also share his delight for loving others. Last few months has got us all down, doesn't it? Been locked up, cooped up. All the news is bad all the time. We have so much uncertainty. And maybe even more than that, we see so much hurt happening all around us in the world. It reveals a little bit about our hearts. But it also reveals something about our God. Because we have a God of mercy, of justice, and of righteousness. As we see how our God works in history, we know him and we understand what his love is. And we know that our God is aching for all of those who are hurting today. That our God is aching also for us in our hurts, in our struggles, in our trials at this time. 
And we also know that our God who loves us has become one of us. And now he has also become one with us by faith. And his love flows through us. And so in these difficult times, we have such great opportunity to declare the love of God, to bring that healing that so many people need, to show mercy to those who need mercy, to demonstrate righteousness to those who have no idea what righteousness is, and to know that when we do these things, when we model God's love and mercy in our homes, when we show God's justice to our neighbors, when we live God's righteousness in our community, that God, he delights also in us. Even in our own imperfect and incomplete ways, our God rejoices because he has chosen to love us. And his mercy, his love, his justice, his righteousness, they never run dry. And he delights to give us life. Amen. Please rise. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds.